Hey everyone, welcome to lecture number 20 of Linear Algebra. This lecture is an introduction to quadratic forms. So let's start off by remembering uh, some facts about inner products. So uh, actually, I'm not going to go back through the definition of an inner product. If you need to review an inner product, then please do so now. But let's let uh, this angle bracket denote an inner product. So let's let this be an uh, inner product on Rn. So remember, the way this works is it takes in two vectors and returns a real number, right, on Rn. And then similarly, let's let, um, let's call it, I was going to use, let, let's, let's, let's use a standard basis here. So E1, E2, through En, let this be the standard basis uh, with respect to Rn. So these E, we know exactly what these basis vectors are in Rn. So let's continue to work with those now. And so remember that the kind of the fundamental example of an inner product was the, the dot product from calculus, which is uh, what we call the scalar product in this class, right? So the scalar product, the scalar product with respect to this standard basis, right? The, the scalar product is given by it's given by this formula. I'll just use parentheses to denote this one. But the scalar product is just given by x transpose times y, right? And it turns out that this is symmetric. Um, it's, you know, it obeys all the rules of an inner product. Um, so this is one way to represent the scalar product is to write it in the notation of the inner product, but, you know, with parentheses to denote that it's a scalar product. But another way is that it is just the uh, vector multiplication, right, x transpose times y for any two vectors in Rn. It turns out that we can represent any inner product in a similar fashion, not exactly the same, um, but we can find a matrix representation of um, any inner product. So again, let's go back to our general generic inner product here. We can say the following. So there is a matrix representation and so this matrix then is going to be a matrix A in our n by n, all right, for every inner product because of the rules of the inner product. So for every inner product with respect to this basis up here, I'll call this E, right? So with respect to our basis E, and it's given as follows. So it's given by the following uh, identity here, the following uh, definition. So our matrix A... I'll write this out, A11, A12. It's an n by n matrix, right? So I'm just writing out the entries here. So A22 through A2n, all the way down AN1, AN2 through ANN. So a square matrix where um, the entries of this matrix, the AIJ, so the IJth entry is defined to be the inner product of EI with EJ, okay? So um, for the scalar product that we're used to, then we know that this is just gonna be EI transpose times EJ. That's not exactly what this is gonna be, so this all depends on the definition of our inner product, but by linearity, we know that, of course, this matrix has to obey certain properties. So for one thing, um, the matrix A must be symmetric because we know that inner products are symmetric. You can change the order and it will not change the outcome, right? Um, so the matrix A, A is symmetric, among other things, okay? But we'll just say for now, we'll just, we just want to focus on the fact that this is a symmetric matrix. And now the whole point of going through all this right now, at this point in the semester, after we've already studied all of this, right? Um, the main point for going through this now is that now we can represent the inner product um, of any vectors x and y. So now any vectors, we'll say x in Rn and y in Rn, they're both Rn, right? Um, so they can be written in the standard basis, right? Um, so they now have their inner product given by a very similar formula to what we had before. So the inner product between x and y is going to be given by, so the inner product of x with y is now going to be equal to x transpose times a times y. All right. 
And so if you work out the details of this, uh, each of these vectors x and y would represent the coefficients of a linear combination of these basis vectors. And then um, when you multiply all this out, you would end up with uh, grabbing the coefficients from the inner product of those two basis vectors and then expanding by linearity, basically. So this just expands everything by linearity. And the point here is that every inner product has a matrix, has a symmetric matrix. And again, for the sake of this lecture, so you could, you could spend a lot of time actually going into depth about um, how this works and how this might be better computationally depending on what you're doing to find the matrix and then just do matrix multiplications. Um, again, depending on what kind of applications you're working on for your inner product. Um, but for the sake of this lecture, now what we want to do is notice a couple of things. So notice that the length squared of a vector, right? So the length squared of x um, which is, remember, always given by x times x inner product for the square of the length. This is now given by x transpose a times x, and this always has to obey the property. This is a number, right? But this always has to obey the property properties of the norm. So this is positive um, in general. It's, it's, it's non-negative in general, right? And it's only 0 if x is the 0 vector. Right, and so in this scenario, x transpose a times x equals zero only if x is the zero vector. Okay, so, and this is the norm. This is called the norm. So this is the norm of the inner product, right, or corresponding to the inner product. So the norm corresponding to this inner product. And now remember, um, the norm just takes in one vector now. So it, it just takes in one vector and then we can compute from there. So uh, what we're gonna do now is generalize this idea of the norm. A norm is a, is a special case of what's called a quadratic form. And so that's what this lecture is on. It's an introduction to quadratic form. So that's why we've gone through all this now. But a norm is, is a square of a length, right? So that's where the quadratic comes from in some sense. It's also there's an x transpose times x. So an x times x involved in the x transpose a x uh, definition here of this norm. And so, you know, we can, we can see where the name quadratic might come from. So a quadratic form, um, I'll just write this as a definition, and then we'll give a, yet another definition of a quadratic form, which kind of goes back to algebra and equations. Um, system, yeah, we'll see in just a second here. So quad, se second order quadratic equations, but um, yeah. So a definition for us of a quadratic form um, is the following. So let's say this. So let's let A be an n by n matrix and be symmetric. So with no other criteria on this. There is more criteria for a norm. Norms have this extra criteria right right here. Um, and, and then some others want some other criteria as well, right? But let's let A be a symmetric uh, matrix, square obviously. So then the function defined by A given by the following. So f of x equals x transpose a x. This is a function which takes in a vector and returns a real number, right? So this takes in a vector in Rn and it returns, it returns just a single real number, right? So put this in parentheses. But this is a function now from the vector space to the field, to the field of real numbers. Um, this is called a quadratic form. So this is a quadratic form for any symmetric matrix, all right? For any symmetric, symmetric matrix A, x transpose times A times x, that function defined by that product, that is a, a quadratic form, okay? And you can say it's quadratic form on Rn if you want. All right, well, let's take a, a slightly different approach now to the same definition. So we're going to define the same thing, a quadratic form, uh, in a slightly different way. So what I've done with this buildup is started with the idea of an inner product and then written the norm, right? Compared the norm with a kind of more general definition of a quadratic form, which is like, like I said, a, a generalization of a norm in some sense, all right? Um, this is all correct and it works on Rn, but now let's kind of zoom in to two-dimensional space, R2, 
and look at a quadratic equation in two variables. So now let's do the following. Let's consider a quadratic quadratic equation in two variables, and I'll call these variables x and y. So two variables, we'll write x, y like this. This is the idea here. Um, and so the quadratic equation in, this, in these variables is going to be something like ax squared plus 2b, and we'll see why we want this 2 in a moment, but 2b xy plus c uh, y squared um, plus dx plus ey plus f equals 0. So for a quadratic uh, equation in two variables, you have to have three squared terms, the x squared term, the x times y term, and the y squared term, and then you have the two linear terms, the x and the y, and then finally you have this f term, right, which is just, just a constant. Um, so this can be written in matrix form, kind of. Well, we'll see what I mean by this, but this can be written in the form. So in the form, if we want, well, basically what we're going to do here is we're going to separate this into the quadratic part, the linear part, and the constant part and write each part individually as a matrix equation. So the quadratic part, to get this equation, it, it can be written as follows, and you can just verify this, uh, but xy, so row vector, times the coefficient matrix, which is going to be a, b, b, c, times the column vector xy. All right, so if you need to take a moment, pause the video, and verify that this product gives you this equation when you multiply all this out, you get exactly this equation, and then the two b's are going to come, the two b in the middle is going to come from the fact that there's two of these here. Okay, and so then um, finally, uh, sorry, next what we have then, right, is that we have de coefficients times vector xy, and then plus f equals zero. So again, linear part, constant part, this is the quadratic part, right? And this is the quadratic form. So if we put the vector x equal to x times y, or sorry, xy, vertical vector xy in R2, and we put the matrix A equal to this matrix A, B, B, C, which is symmetric, by the way. That's a symmetric matrix, right? Um, then this part that's underlined in red is given by our quadratic form that we defined up above, right? It's given by x transpose times a times x. All right, and so this is the quadratic form of this equation. So quadratic form of the quadratic equation. Okay, so uh, two different definitions. They both gave us the same formula, though, right? So for a symmetric matrix A, this is done in, in two dimensions, but this can all be extended to higher dimensions, right? Um, we we kind of started with higher dimensions, and now this method of looking at the equation, this method gets us back to two dimensions, um, but both equations are the same, right? That the function f of x equal to x transpose times matri symmetric matrix A times x uh, this this is a quadratic form. This is the definition of a quadratic form. Okay, so let's now take a moment to look at some geometry. Um, geometry of these quadratic equations in two-dimensional space. And then we'll talk about what this tells us and what, how we can use uh, our matrices to help us understand this information. But given a quadratic equation of this form, there are a few possibilities. Basically, they're called conic sections, but based on the, the values of A, B, C, D, E, and F, um, there's different geometric possibilities of what these, what these graphs could look like, right? So um, the possibilities, so right here we're just going to talk about a little geometry. So a little geometry here. Um, the possibilities of, these, of this equation, so this equation star, this could represent one of, we're going to break it into four possibilities. It's really three possibilities plus one, three, three plus another special one. Um, but these, this equation could represent any of the following geometric shapes, right? And these are called conic sections. You should have studied these in calculus too. Um, in pretty much, in, in pretty 
pretty much in depth. But these could give it, they could lead to a circle, could lead to an ellipse, right? Could lead to a hyperboloid, or sorry, a hyperbola, uh, or it could lead to a parabola. All right, and so the forms of these all vary uh, just by, they vary just uh, a, a little bit, right? So I'm going to write an example of each one. So a circle is just given by x squared plus y squared equals r squared, okay? And so again, if you go back up to the equation, what would that mean? A is 1, C is 1, 0, 0, 0 for B, D, and E, and then F would have to be um, negative to, so that when you move it over, it would be r squared. It would be positive, right? But f would have to be negative in this equation so that when it moves over, it would be, po it would be positive, and that would give you a circle, all right? So I'm just going to go in order here of uh, the way I've written them. What about an ellipse? Well, an ellipse is like a circle that's been stretched in the two directions that are, you know, not, not stretched in an equal way, right? Um, so in this case, an ellipse is like x over alpha squared plus y over beta squared equals r squared, where alpha and beta here are positive. So it can't be zero, of course, because um, you cannot divide by zero, but also we want them to be positive, not negative. Okay, so uh, what about the next one? Well, a hyperbola, hyperbola is very similar to this equation. It can be stretched in, in different ways, right? Um, but one of these two is going to be negative. So for example, I'm not writing every possibility here. But a hyperbola would be something like x over alpha quantity squared minus y over beta quantity squared equals r squared. And then you can switch this and make this negative x over alpha squared plus y over beta squared, if you wish, right? And then finally, I think we all know what a parabola looks like. But a parabola would be something like uh, y equals alpha x squared or something, or, you know, vice versa. Maybe x equals alpha y squared, beta y squared or something. All right, so these are the geometric possibilities of what the shape could be. And we then um, want to kind of in, in, examine the geometry of these things and how the matrix plays a role in that. That is kind of um, where this lecture is going to head, and then we'll, we'll leave it here. But we have a little work to do to do that. So, for example, let's look at the following. Let's try to identify this, the geometry of this quadratic equation that I'm going to write down. So let's say we're given an equation 9x squared minus 18x plus 4y squared plus 16y minus 11 equals 0. All right. Uh, and we want to identify, identify the conic. All right. We can say the graph or the conic or the conic section or whatever. Right. So I'm just going to say the conic and, and kind of encapsulate it all in this statement here. But we want to try to identify this. So... Um, what we need to do is try to get this equation into one of these forms, and we can't choose which one it is. We just kind of need to find out which one it will be, right? Um, these all have an x, and a, they, there's an x and a y term, right, the linear terms. So what we have to do, you probably are not surprised, is we have to factor this um, by completing the square and then compare, right, and then compare. So this first term I'm going to write as 9 times x squared minus 2x, and then leave some space here. And then we can factor a 4 out of this next term. So this will be y squared plus 4y, and then leave some space, right? We're going to add in each of these. And really, I should leave a little more space here. Um, and then here. And then I'm going to say, all right, this one equals 11 over here. Yeah, I don't need the space here, but it's fine. So this all looks good. So now to complete the square, what do we have to do? Well, for this one, we have to add 1. So we're going to add 1 to both sides, right? And we've all completed the square. We don't need to go through this. But here we have to add 4. We've all completed the square, and yet I did it wrong, right? So we have to add 1 inside here, which is adding 9 to the whole side, right? So we have to add 9. 1 times 9. On this one, we have to add 4 inside, which is 16 total, right? So we have to add 16 over here. And then uh, this becomes 9 times x minus 1 quantity squared plus... 4 times y plus 2 quantity squared equals 36, right? And so then we divide through by the common uh, common denominator. It will end up being, right? But a common factor here, which is going to be 36. So this one ends up being uh, x minus 1 over 2 
quantity squared, right? Divide by 36, we're left with 4 here. Plus this one we're going to divide by 36, we're going to be left with 9. So this one will be y plus 2 over uh, 3 quantity squared. And then this one is 1. We divide it by 36, right? And so we can see then that this is an ellipse that has been shifted, right? So this is a shifted ellipse. So this one's going to be an ellipse. All right. It's shifted so that its new center, quote unquote, is at the point uh, 1, negative 2. And the scaling factors are 2 in the x direction and 3 in the y direction, right? 2 in the x direction and 3 in the y direction. So this graph is going to look like the following. So there's our x and our y axis. We can shift this now. So this is going to be shifted so that its center is at x equals uh, 1. So this is like our new y axis, y prime. And then its center in the y direction is going to be negative 2. So this is like our x prime axis. And this point right here is 1, negative 2. And then um, the graph, right, the ellipse is going to be stretched so that it is uh, too wide, right? It goes two units away from this in the x direction and three units away in the y direction. So it's going to go up to here and down to here in the y direction. It's going to go over to here and over to here in the x direction. I'm just making up these spots, right? And then pretend that this is an ellipse. All right, and so this is the graph. This is the graph of the equation. And it is an ellipse, right? Um, where, so this one goes through negative 1, this one goes through 3, this is 1, this is negative 5, right? And so the whole point here is this length is 3, this length is 2. And that's because of these numbers, right? It's because of the alpha and the beta um, from these equations. Again, you should have done this extensively in Calc 2. This should all be, this should all be review. So um, if it's not, please go back and review your Calc 2 text to see, to see uh, exactly how this all should work, right? Um, so essentially what we've done here, and I'm going to rewrite this equation one more time, and then we'll do another, one more example before we give a few definitions. But um, what we've done here to get this ellipse over in, in this to get this equation, I should say, to look like this equation, right? We've made this change of variables, and I, I wrote the x prime and the y prime, right? So we've made some, we've made a change of coordinates, right? A change of coordinates. We've made this change of coordinates so that uh, our x prime is equal to x minus one, right? And our y prime is equal to y plus two. Okay, and so this then made our equation, so our equation, this, this equation right here, which we'll call 2 star, this equation 2 star became then uh, x prime squared over 2 squared plus y prime squared over 3 squared equals 1. All right, and so that's where, that's where those numbers came from. Uh, the, the stretch factors, right, the, the 2 and the 3. Uh, just came from a change of variables here to make this look like this. Okay, so this example involves a an ellipse which is not rotated at all, right? So the the major axes are and the minor axis, the major and minor axis are parallel to the x and the y axis. So the x prime is parallel to the x axis, the y prime is parallel to the y axis. And this was pretty simple, pretty straightforward computation then, right? But if if the graph is rotated at all, then um, then it takes a little more careful careful attention, right? So if the x prime and y prime axes, similar to the ones that I just defined here by this change of coordinates, if these axes are rotated as well, they could still be shifted, right? But if they're also rotated as well as shifted, um, or translated, I should say. So this is just a simple translation of the center from here to here, right? But if this is also rotated, then we then we have to do a little more work, right? But if the axes are also are rotated as well as possibly translated, all right, then um, our change of coordinates is not a linear change. It's not so not it's still a linear change, but it's not so simple, right? It's not this simple as as the change that we just made. 
So our change of coordinates to understand the graph so is then um, going to be given by the following. So then we're going to put our x prime as a vector now. We'll just write this as a vector because there's going to be multiple uh, changes now, right? But x prime is going to be equal to q times x, where q here, q is an orthogonal matrix. All right? And so this orthogonal matrix, uh, this orthogonal matrix will then um, this will represent a rotation, all right? So here Q represents a rotation of, in this case, the plane, right? So a rotation of the plane. So the idea is that we'll rotate first and then you can go ahead and solve um, solve the translation problem the same way that we just did. So the rotation problem is going to get rid of any um, any x times y terms that might be that might be in in the problem, all right? So basically our rotation matrix Q is going to be exactly what we worked out very very early in the semester. Right? It's going to be cosine theta, sine theta, and then minus sine theta, cosine theta. So this is a rotation matrix which will rotate the equation so that it becomes as follows. So remember our general equation, equation one star, when we rewrote it in matrix form, was given by x transpose a times x um, plus this de, right? So this vector de, then also times x, right? Um, plus f equals zero. And so applying q, we're gonna, so applying this change of variables right here, then what we end up with um, is the following. So then we end up with the following. So we have x prime transpose times q transpose times a times q uh, times x prime. So this is all just replacing, remember this was, this was our x, right? And so that means all this, and you can check it, is x transpose. So all of this, Plus, uh, then this is going to be DE all right, times Q times X prime. These are just primes. That's not a transpose. Plus F. All right. And so this will be the new. This will be the new vector which we could replace by D prime E prime. All right. That would be D prime E prime. And then we have our X prime and then our F and it still equals zero. F doesn't get changed. Right. And so now this equation we can solve this you know as long as you choose your rotation matrix correctly then you can solve this equation by um, by the same method that we just did the previous one so figuring out the graph of that by the previous one all right so in this case what we then do is we look at this matrix here and so the proper rotation is going to make this into a diagonal matrix here um, so essentially the proper choice of Q the Q that we're looking for is going to in the two in the two dimensional case. This is going to turn this into. Um, this is going to turn this into. As long as we choose everything correctly, this will be a diagonal matrix where the diagonal entries are the eigenvalues of the matrix A. So they're the eigenvalues of the problem. All right, and so then the equation then becomes. So equation star, now becomes a transformed equation becomes lambda one times x prime squared plus lambda 2 times y prime squared. These are the components of x vector x prime and then plus d prime x prime plus e prime y prime plus f equals 0 and then at this point you can complete the square and do exactly what we did in the previous one, right? So up in this problem we had only x squared y squared x y, right? We have that. Those are the only terms we have. So the rotation matrix gets us in this form right here, and then we can solve it. All right, so um, it's a little bit uh, convoluted the way that I've presented this here, so that's, that's my fault, I'm sorry. But, but the idea, though, is that uh, there are two possibilities, right? Either you can, solve, you can figure out the shape of the conic section by completing the square, or you need to rotate your, your problem, rotate your coordinate system first, to get it in a form where you can then complete the square to determine the 
the conic section that you're working with, right? So, and then once you know the conic section, then you can pick out the, the parts of the conic section, the eccentricity, et cetera, the new center point, et cetera, right? So let's now look at an example um, of a problem that requires rotation, all right? And so I'll, I'll show you how this will all work. But here's an equation, 3x squared plus 2xy plus 3y squared minus 8 equals 0. So on this example, we just want to focus on the rotation to solve the problem, right? So we want to focus on the rotation. And so in this example, I have not included these terms, all right? They could still be there, right? They could be there. But I've, we've chosen an example where we just want to see how the rotation works and how we can determine what the rotation is um, by eigenvalue type methods here, right? So uh, here's what we're going to do. We basically, the first thing that we want to do is write down the quadratic form that corresponds to this equation. So this number right here, this is just a constant. That's not part of the quadratic form. This one is part of the quadratic form, right? So the vector x in our setup is xy. That's always going to be the case for these problems. The matrix A is then going to be the matrix whose entries are 3 and 3 on the diagonal. Why? Because 3 and 3, those are the coefficients on the squared terms. And then remember there is a 2, uh, 2 times b in the center term, right, in the, in the xy term. So the, actually the b, this right here is 2b. So this one is just 1, right? And so this is our matrix A. Now, we even set up here that Q transpose AQ is supposed to be a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues, right? So let's find the eigenvalues of this matrix and then find unit eigenvectors, right? Um, unit eigenvectors, which will then give us our, our rotation, hopefully, right? So let's try to find it. So our eigenvalues, we have to, we have to compute. So the eigenvalues of A. Well, look at this. The eigenvalues of A are going to be the, so let's write down the characteristic polynomial, right? This is going to be lambda minus 3 squared minus 1, which is lambda squared minus 6 lambda plus 9 minus 1, so plus 8, and then this factors, right? So this is then going to be uh, lambda minus 2 times lambda minus 4. Multiply those together, get 8. Add them together, get 6. So lambda 1 is going to be, let's do this from uh, decreasing order, just like we did with our singular values, even though these are eigenvalues, but let's do it the same way. So the largest one is 4, and the smaller one is 2. And so this means that our, our diagonal matrix, right, our diagonal matrix is going to be uh, given by this one right here. But these, these are the coefficients then. But let's find the eigenvalue, eigenvectors now. So the eigenvectors, we have to find the corresponding eigenvectors, right? So for lambda 1, we need to find x1. When lambda 1 is 4, our matrix equation becomes, our, we need to find the null space, right? So when we subtract 4, this is negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1, augment it. And then it's pretty clear that in this case, these have to be equal, right? So x equals y. So x equals y. And so our vector is going to be like 1, 1, except uh, it needs to be a unit vector, right? So to make it a unit vector, we're going to choose our x1. Sorry, let's call this Q1, because this is our matrix Q, right? This is going to be the columns of our matrix Q. So our Q1 is going to be 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. All right, just to make that a unit vector. Its length is root 2. Same thing now for lambda 2. Lambda 2 is equal to 2 in this case, right? So um, let's see. Lambda 2 equal to 2. Now we have 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. Right? And so this says that x has to equal minus y. And so now our vector looks like 1 minus 1. And then making that a unit vector, our q2 is 1 root 2, negative 1 root 2, 1 over root 2. All right, and then you can check that these are indeed orthogonal, right? And they are normal. So these will form an orthonormal matrix, right? So our Q is given by 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2 for the first column, 1 over root 2, negative 1 over root 2 in the second column. Its transpose is just itself, right? So in this case, Q equals Q transpose. So uh, this one is its own inverse, right? 
and let's see what happens next, right? So now our that means that our A, well, okay, so Q transpose times A times Q is going to be our diagonal matrix, right? So Q transpose times A times Q. This is going to be our diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues. So this will be the matrix 4, 2 on the diagonal, 0, 0. And our change of coordinates, right, are that x prime is equal to q times x. All right? And so remember, this, these are our new entries in our new equation. So x prime, y prime. And so let's write out our matrix. 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, negative 1 over root 2 times our old variables, x and y. And our change of variables is then, right, that the x prime is equal to 1 over root 2x uh, plus 1 over root 2y. And this one is going to be 1 over root 2x minus 1 over root 2y. So y prime is equal to that, x prime is equal to that. But um, this is not exactly what we're, I mean, this is fine, right? This is the change of variables if you wanted to write out a formula for them. And the whole point here is that we have to, x prime and y prime have to depend on both x and y now. Whereas in our previous example, they just depended on the previous x and the y values, right? Based on our completing the square. Um, now, what is our rotate? So th these numbers right here are the stretch factors, right? So the, the lambdas. Those are going to tell us how to stretch um, our, so let me just write it this way. So x prime, so x prime transpose times this whole product, q transpose a q times x prime. This is going to give us then uh, 4 x prime squared plus 2, right, 2 y prime squared. So 2 y prime squared minus 8 equals 0. So this is our new equation. All right, so this is our new equation. Okay, um, this then tells us the stretch factors because now we can rearrange, right? So now this equation can look like uh, x prime squared. We divide through by 8, right? So when we divide through by 8, this is over 2 plus y prime squared over 4 equals 8 divided by 8 is 1, right? And so then we see x prime over root 2 squared plus y prime over 2 squared equals 1. This is the equation of our ellipse now with respect to the axes x prime and y prime. The question now is how are x prime and y prime related uh, related to um, the old, the x and the y, right? So the x and the y coordinates. So here's our y axis. Here's our x axis. So the center is here. We have, Remember, we chose this problem so that there was no translation necessary, right? Uh, we just want to see how the rotation affects things. Now remember, to find the rotation, we found this matrix Q. This is our rotation matrix. So the rotation Q on one hand is cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta, right? And it's given by this matrix, 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, um, 1 over root 2, negative 1 over root 2. So what does this mean? We've kind of, I've kind of, uh, we've got a bit, slight problem here. And that's that uh, this is supposed to be the same, right, as this. So I made a choice up here when I chose my, eigenval my eigenvector. X had to be equal to minus Y, and I chose to make the Y be the negative one. I want to go back and make that one, right, be there, so that the minus sign is here, plus sign here, minus sign, whoops. Uh, minus sign here, plus sign here, right? And so then this is not true, but that's okay. Uh, this matrix is still the same. This is still true. All right, that's, that's part of all this. This is minus, this is plus, so that would make this minus and this plus, right? It doesn't change this equation at all, though. So that choice does not change this equation. And the only reason that we need to do it, right, is to make sure that this is all correct. 
so that, so that this matches the same form as this. All right, so for our rotation matrix. Okay, so now if we believe this, and we now we've made that change to our to our eigenvector here, and again, remember you have a whole eigenspace worth of eigenvectors to choose from, right? So this doesn't change anything in terms of that decomposition. Um, but what we notice then is that uh, cosine of theta is equal to one over root two, right? Is equal to one over root two. And sine of theta is also equal to 1 over root 2. And now we've got it so that it does match up properly, right? So sine of theta is also equal to 1 over root 2. And so taken together, this, this would tell us that either, um, either theta is equal to pi over 4 or negative pi over 4 or 3 pi over 4 or something. But taken together, this tells us that our rotation is theta equal to pi over 4, right? So theta is equal to pi over 4. All right, and, and so that's going to give us a positive rotation. And so what we end up with is that our new x-axis, x prime, is this axis, theta equal to pi over 4 rotation. And similarly, our new y-axis is rotated by pi over 4. Still orthogonal here, right? So there's our y prime. And now uh, we, can, we can sketch this, right? So our, our ellipse, this is an ellipse again, right? Our ellipse goes out two units in the y prime axis. So one, two, one, two. We'll just write this. So this is two units. And then it goes out only root two, which is a little over one, right? So root two, 1.4. This is root two in this direction. And then we fill out, pretend that's an ellipse. We fill out this ellipse that's been rotated by pi over 4 units. So this is the graph of the equation 3x squared plus 2xy plus 3y squared minus 8 equals 0. So that's exactly this one. How did we solve it? We changed the coordinates, right, so that our major axes, our major axes were, um, our major and minor axes then, right, so that our equation was in terms of our major and minor axes, and then the scale factors, right, are related to the eigenvalues of this matrix because we chose the Q to diagonalize the matrix. And then when we wrote out, when we worked out the new quadratic equation, right, we found that these terms are kind of crisscross. Those are the scaling factors in the appropriate directions. All right, so the whole point of this is that um, when, ch you know, as long as we get our matrix Q in the right form, then our matrix can tell us a whole lot about um, about the geometry of our system. Number one, it tells us the rotation of our axes. And number two, we might need to complete the square, right? But um, if it's an ellipse, though, the eigenvalues tell us something about the major and minor axis lengths, right? So, um, so this is exactly how this is going to work. So let's state a theorem now. And... Uh, a couple definitions, and then we'll call this one. So the major, the major thing that I wanted to go through was just the geometry of what's going on here, and um, but a theorem, which is going to be important probably later on in your in your life in your studies. And we'll state this now. So this is called the principal axis theorem. So the principal axes theorem. All right, principal axis theorem says the following. It says if A is a real symmetric n by n matrix, then there's always a change of basis that will do what we wanted to do there, right? So then there is a change of coordinates Uh, u equals q transpose times x, all right, such that, whoops, it's just q times x, sorry, u equals q times x such that uh, x transpose a x equals u transpose d u, where u, uh, sorry, d, d is diagonal. So the matrix D is diagonal. So in this scenario, D is diagonal. Okay. 
And so that's basically what we just worked through. The principal axis theorem tells us that this is always possible. We're not going to prove this, um, but it is always possible to find this, um, to find such a diagonal matrix D. All right, a couple other definitions, and then, like I said, we'll call this lecture quits, but um, a real symmetric uh, N by N matrix to be symmetric has to be square, right? A, this is said to be, and here's a couple of definitions. One, it's said to be positive definite, positive definite, this is what we're defining, uh, if and only if, it's a definition here, but if and only if x transpose a times x is greater than zero for all x that are not equal to the zero vector. Obviously, uh, if x is the zero vector, that'll be zero, right? Um, but if, it's, if this is always greater than zero, then this is called positive definite. It's going to be called positive semi-definite positive semi-definite if you can probably guess right so if x transpose a times x is greater than or equal to zero for all x in rn so now the idea here is so of course if you're positive definite then you are positive semi-definite um, you could add to this definition if you want that semi-definite implies that you're not definite but um, that's not the way it's written in the text, so I'll leave it here this way uh, for now. But the idea here is that it's possible to have uh, vectors x for which this is equal to zero that are not the zero vector, but for any vector for which this product is not zero, then it's got to be positive. That's the positive semi-definite. Number three, um, you can probably guess this too, but negative definite, Negative definite and negative semi-definite are going to be the same, right? So negative definite is if x transpose a x is less than 0 for all x not equal to 0. Negative semi-definite. So negative semi-definite is if x transpose a x is less than or equal to 0 for all x in Rn, and then five, uh, indefinite if none of these are true. So, so if none of these others hold, then, we're, then our matrix is indefinite. And this leads us to a theorem. All right, how do we check for positive definite, positive semi-definite, etc.? Well, it turns out that we just have to look at the eigenvalues, okay? So let A be a real symmetric matrix in Rn by N. Then A is positive definite if and only if uh, all of its eigenvalues are positive. All right, and so then you could actually generalize this theorem to fit every one of these cases, right? So positive semi-definite is going to be uh, all non-zero eigenvalues are positive, but it could have some zero eigenvalues. Same thing for negative definite. All eigenvalues being negative means negative definite. All eigenvalues that are non-zero being negative means negative semi-definite. Zero eigenvalues uh, exist, like having zero eigenvalues, right, makes it semi for either in either case, right? And then indefinite if you just have a mixture of positive and negative uh, eigenvalues for your matrix. All right, so this is pretty straightforward stuff. Just a couple definitions to end this lecture. Um, the geometry here, again, should be review of Calc 2 geometry, but now we have a matrix approach to looking, uh, to looking at this, to, to looking at the situation to help us identifying what kind of conic section we're working with using our quadratic form, which again is a product of vectors and matrices um, from this point of view, and, and then looking at the eigenvalues of this to help us determine positive, negative, definite, etc. So I'm going to leave this lecture here, and I'll talk to you guys in the next one.